44. And it's good to see Miss Linda. It's been a been a while. It's always a, always good to see her. We're 244. We'll sing the first and last verse. Let's sing. Time is filled with swift transition. No.
I'll be reading this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> Though I speak with the tongues of men, of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profit me nothing. Please stand for the opening prayer. Let's all pray together. Lord, our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before thee, petitioning thee this hour, thanking thee for this beautiful Lord's day you have given us, thanking thee for the, the rain you have given in the past days, Father, and the sunshine. Lord, we're so thankful for uh, thy power and thy majesty that is uh, bestowed each and every day. Father, we're thankful for this congregation of thy people who have assembled here this morning, so thankful for each and every member of it, so thankful for the recent growth we've experienced, Father, realizing all these good and perfect gifts come from thee. Father, we're so thankful for thy visitors that have come this way this morning to join us in this worship service, Father. We pray that they will find a congregation that is earnestly and diligently seeking to do thy will and take as many uh, to heaven as we can, Father, and fulfill that great commission that thou hast commanded. <coughs> Father, we're so thankful for our regular minister here, Brother Troy Maynutt. We're thankful for he and his family as they labor here with us in the kingdom. I would pray that you would be with him this morning as he'll soon be in the pulpit and breaking unto us the bread of life, Father. And we pray that we will be receptive to the things that are said this morning, Father, that we can take something uh, instructional, uh, use it in our everyday lives, Father. And we pray that the service would allow us to be edified, allow us to be uplifted so that we can go out uh, into a world, Father, that seems to be uh, corrupt and deceitful, Father, and that we can be a, a shining light around those whom we come uh, in contact with. Father, we have so many things to be mindful this morning. Father, so many things to pray for. Father, we have an extended uh, list of people, Father, that uh, were just mentioned on the sick list. We have uh, many who have solicited our prayers, Father, and we pray for uh, each and every one of them. Uh, Father, we uh, have so many of this number who have family uh, that are ailing. We have family that are in hospitals and are undergoing tests, Father, and have much anxiety and stress in their lives, Father, and we pray that uh, you would be with each and every one of them, Father, and, and comfort them in a way that, that only thy can, uh, and we pray, Father, that also that uh, during these difficult and, uh, and tragic times that we can uh, take to the scriptures, uh, find those things that give us great, great comfort, Father, uh, specifically knowing that uh, life upon this earth is temporary and all the treasures and all the mansions have been built. Thou hast prepared a place for us, Father. And if we live as Thou hast commanded to us uh, upon this earth, that we know uh, all that inherits is ours. Father, we are so thankful for uh, Thy Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ, who makes any hope, any chance of salvation achievable, Father. We're so thankful that he shed that precious blood uh, upon Calvary's cross. We're so thankful for its redeeming power. And we know, Father, that we can come into contact with that blood uh, through the obedience of thy word, through that watery grave of baptism, Father, where we know that as we uh, are immersed and we rise from the water, we know that those sins, uh, those uh, past transgressions, Father, are removed. We become white as snow in thy sight, Father. And we can strive to live daily uh, and progress forward in the faith and do those things which thou would have us to in thy word. Father, we pray that you would be with each and every one of us this morning as we are preparing our minds to focus and meditate upon uh, the acts of worship this morning. We pray that we can uh, go through these things uh, acceptably in thy sight and each and every one will be done in accordance to thy will. And uh, that would be pleased with our worship service here this day, and uh, it would be offered up acceptably. Father, all these things, uh, all these thanksgivings, Father, all these requests, we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Remain standing, if you will. 
it's that time of the week when we will observe uh, the Lord's Supper here in just a few moments. Let's sing number 299 to prepare our minds for that. I know it's often difficult to do uh, to truly clear one's minds of all the things that distract us and the cares of the world, uh, but for the next few moments, I um, hope that you'll be able to do that. And it truly is amazing uh, what Christ did for us on that great day. 299. <clears throat> I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall I
this cup represents Christ's blood that was shed on that cross. Christ's name pray. Amen. A separate part from our Lord's Supper, we'd like to take this time to give back to our Father. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, at this time we just come together to give thanks back to you for all the many blessings that you've given us. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for our jobs, our homes, the food that we have to eat every day. Dear Heavenly Father, at this time we just pray that each and every one of us have set back a portion of that's rightfully thine, to give cheerfully and not grudgingly. Christ, we pray. Amen. This morning will be number 667. If you would like to go ahead and mark that in your hymnal, number 667. <clears throat>
good to see each and every one with us this morning. We have several visitors with us, and we want you to know you are an honored guest, and we want you to take a visitor's card. There should be one in the pew in front of you. Fill it out and leave it there upon the pew if you haven't already uh, done that, and we would like to have that uh, record of your being here with us this morning. It's good to have Miss Linda Payton with us. Miss Linda was one of the I guess you would say one of the originals, I guess, when we first began to reestablish the congregation here at Skyline, when the old building used to sit in the parking lot. But uh, anyway, it's good to have her. Brother Elkin was here with her at that time, but Sam has gone, passed on to his reward. It's always good to have Miss Linda. She's always, uh, she's telling me she's still working up there where she's staying, in Little Rock, Arkansas, talking to those people as much as she can about the Bible. And that's good, and we're thankful for her and what she means to the kingdom. But we're also glad that you're here this morning if you're visiting with us, and we want you to come back at any opportunity that you might have. This morning, we're going to talk about love. We're going to talk about the other side of love. Uh, take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, where we'll begin this morning. Nothing in the world is more important than that word love. A lot of times it's abused and misused in the world today. And that's understandable in the English language because in the English language we only have one word for love, and that is love. And so in the Greek language, which the New Testament was originally written, there were four Greek words, each one having a different definition than the other, depending upon the kind of love one was talking about. And so we only have the one word love, so many times we have to pay attention very close as to how people use that word to understand the meaning of that word, per se. So this morning I want us to look at the Bible and see what it has to say because there's a lot of mis misunderstanding and a lot of abuse of this word love the day in which we live. Look at Matthew chapter 22 beginning there with verse 35. Then one of them which was a lawyer asked him a question tempting him saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and the great commandment and the second is likened to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. It has taken me a long time in life to realize this particular verse 40 here. But when we sit down and look at what was the few verses read right before verse 40, we can see exactly what he means here when he says, On these two commandments hang all the law. If we love God the way we ought, and that word love here in the Greek is agape love. Agape love is the highest love that man has. In other words, I love you when you're not lovable. That's agape love. Christ loved you. He died on the cross while you were yet a sinner, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Not when you were lovable did God love you. He loves you even though you are sometimes very unlovable. Agape love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That love is agape love. Now the love that I am to have for God is agape love. I mean, I am to love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. And the account of Mark tells us there. So if I understand God correctly... And what Jesus was saying here, there should be no one, no love greater than the love that I have for my God. I realize that the marriage relationship is a great love within itself. Matter of fact, the love that I have for God and the love that I have for my wife and my family are close and tight. But God should come first even in that great capacity as such. And so Jesus says, not only am I to love God, but what second did he say? The second is likened to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Oh, there is, a, there is a commandment that is very difficult. Thou shalt love thy neighbor 
as thyself. Agape love once again. I love my neighbor as myself. How much do I love self? I haven't seen anybody abusing themselves lately. That's how much we love self. We don't abuse ourselves. And so the great love that we have for God and that we have for our, our fellow man should be a great love. As a matter of fact, turn with me, if you would, to the book of John, chapter 13. In John, chapter 13, look at verse 35. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one toward another. Here is the badge of discipleship as far as the Christian is concerned. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one toward another. We live in a world today which, as I said earlier, abuses the word love. Sometimes we confuse the word love and lust. A young boy and a young girl who have just started dating and have only dated for a week or two, and then they begin telling each other they love one another, are not really in love with one another. They don't even know each other yet. It is not agape love. It is not the kind of love that is the highest concern that a boy should have for a young girl if they were to ever talk about marriage. Sometimes we confuse the word love and lust. Now I want to read a quotation to you. Bernaski, I don't know who he is, but he has a lot of things here that gives us some different views as to what love actually is in the minds of some people in the way we use the word love. He says, unfortunately, no word was ever used so loosely by so many to mean so much or so little. Paperback pushers shout, here is a love story to really get you going. Hollywood hawks, adults only, completely uncut, love in the raw. A parishioner whispers to her husband, don't you just love the preacher's new tie? Don't you? A passionate 16-year-old coaxes his steady, don't be so square. If you love me like you say, you'll prove it. A bookkeeper with a nervous stomach declines, no, no thank you. Yeah, I, I love onions, but they don't love me. Well, this gives you some idea as to how we use the word love. A young man dating a young girl, trying to coax her into doing something that should not be done, will use the phrase, if you love me like you say I do, then you will prove it. That's not love, that's lust. Young people, you need to learn the difference between love and lust. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, as we read just a few moments ago, in verse 13 of chapter 13, and now abide faith, hope, charity, which is love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And we know what faith is. Faith is such as things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Our faith is built upon the study of God's Word, so then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. We know what hope is. Hope is that which sustains us as Christians. I haven't seen heaven, but I've heard about heaven, and I desire to go to heaven, and I want to live in such a way that that desire becomes a reality. We want to hear God say in the last day, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joys of the kingdom. That's what we desire to hear. And it's important that that's a part of our lives. But now look at verses 1 through 3 that were read a few moments ago. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels. Now, we have to keep in context of what is taking place in chapter 13. He's talking about love in this chapter. In chapter 12, he was talking about the different gifts that were given. 
And so when he picks up, though I speak with the tongues of men, that was one of the gifts, and of angels, have not charity or love, I am become as a sounding brass tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, that was another gift that could be given in the early church. And understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. So we see just how important love actually is. We can say we love someone, but action shows it more than what we say. A husband who tells his wife, I love you, and then turns around and leaves that day and goes to sees another woman is not in love with his wife. Or vice versa, whether it be the wife or the husband in that situation. That's not love, as we sometimes view that. A lot of people would say that's love, but no, that's not love. That's lust. And so it's very important that we come to an understanding of what these mean, the extreme attitudes toward this thing, thing called love. Our children need to know the difference. Now, we live in a world that has the idea that love, 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 I love you, you love me, everybody's love, everybody's happy, and so on. And that's what love is all about. After all, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, who shall believe and not perish, but have everlasting life. God is love. First John chapter, what is it, 4 verse 8? We understand that God is love. Now, the last two weeks we've talked about the goodness of God. And last week we talked about uh, the severity of God. The fact is, God loves us all. He loves mankind. He doesn't love the sin that we commit from time to time, but He does love the souls of man. As Christians, we love the souls of mankind. We don't approve of the sin that we commit or they commit from time to time, but we still love them as such. But this morning, I want us to look at this idea love is more than some see it. It is both positive, but it's also negative. Love can be positive, but also love can be negative. It's the negative I want to look at this morning because here's the part we sometimes don't see. We see all the other that he speaks of. When you go and you continue reading here in verse 4, Charity suffereth long, charity envieth not, charity boneth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseeming, seeketh not her own. I mean, that tells us things, good things about love, what it should and shouldn't do. But here are some negative things. I want six things this morning we're going to look at as we talk about this. First of all, love suffers. Love suffers. This is especially seen in family relationships. If, for instance, someone close in the family passes away, then our love suffers because of the passing of our loved one. And that is normal. Matter of fact, in John chapter 11, verse 35, the Bible said, as Jesus was there at the tomb of Lazarus, that Jesus wept, the shortest verse in the Bible. But then the next verse talks about how he, be, behold, he loved him, it says. The people observing how Jesus cried said, behold, how he loved him. You see, Jesus suffered at the death of Barnabas, as we suffer at the death of our loved ones just as well. When one dies, the whole family suffers as a result. Some suffer more because of the relationship they may hold with one another, but we still suffer. When a son or a daughter goes astray, does not the family, that those parents, mother and father, do they not suffer as a result of that child going astray? As you look at the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, you see how that the father looked every day down that road for that child. Because when he decided to come home, it says that his father saw him afar off. So he was looking every day. That father suffered because of his lost son or lost daughter. Families suffer, love suffers, as a result of the loss of one or another. When it comes to God's family, the church, 
the church suffers. When one member suffers, we all suffer, the Bible teaches. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 26. He says, And whether one member suffer, all members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all members rejoice with it. There's the love that we should have one for another. The family of God should be as close as the family of mankind. And that's a relationship we have not come to grips with yet, I'm afraid. That in the church, we as a family of God should be as close as if not closer than the family of the human race. Because after all, we as Christians are exemplifying our love, not only toward God, but go back, what was the second greatest commandment? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Who is our neighbor? Any man in need, and especially our brethren, Galatians said. Paul said in the book of Galatians chapter 6. And so love suffers. When one member suffers, we all suffer. When one member rejoices, we all rejoice with that. What a wonderful thing it was here, what, two weeks ago when we had the baptism of Ben McVeigh and then the same night John Adam and Alicia got the call for their new baby, Collins. And we all rejoiced. We were all happy here at Skyline. Well, that's what the family of God does. We're happy. Now, when sorrow strikes, yes, we're sorrowful. Hopefully we have a heart of sorrow one for another. When we are deeply crushed over the ungodliness of a brother in Christ, then that's love. That's the love that God would have us to have. And so love, first of all, suffers. Second of all, love disciplines. Love disciplines. This is often overlooked at home. And I say that because we live in a world today where discipline is not as it ought to be in the home, but love demands chastening. Look with me, if you would, the book of Hebrews, chapter, what chapter I want here? Six. Hebrews chapter six. We know that God chastens us. Beginning with chapter six, Well, I've dropped that verse somewhere. Hebrews chapter 12, maybe it is. Let me look there. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning with verse 5. There we are. I found it. I only lost for a moment. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son. Despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? So, one of the avenues, one of the characteristics of love is the fact that it disciplines. In the book of Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 24, the psalmist, the, uh, Solomon said, he that spareth the rod hateth his child, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. <clears throat> now, we're, we're not in the beating contest. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the discipline. Discipline is exactly what children need today in the home. Love demands that we discipline our children. If we say, I love my son, I love my daughter, and yet I show no discipline toward them whatsoever, I allow them to do whatever they choose, whatever they want, then I'm not being fair to my child. My child needs to be told, no. I know that's not, that's not a word we, as parents we like to tell our children. But we live in a permissive society. We live in a society where... We allow anything and everything to go on and never say anything about it, supposedly. And yet we claim to love one another. That's not love. Love disciplines. A parent who really loves a child will not withhold from him or her that which will make him healthy and strong. Well, how in the world? My father used to tell me, Son, this is going to hurt me worse than it did you. I said, you just don't know, Dad. I'm the one fixing to get the beating. 
I, I really didn't understand that. I understand it now, now that I have children. It does hurt. Parents, the hardest thing in the world you'll ever do is to spank that baby's hand the first time. That's the hardest thing you'll ever do in life because they have to be spanked from time to time. Little children grow up to be what they're allowed to grow up to be. If you never discipline them, then they'll grow up to be what we don't want, and that's a B-R-A-T, a brat. Nobody wants a brat for half the babysitter to take care of. And so we as Christians love disciplines. It's not easy. Matter of fact, a survey says the Better Homes and Garden concerning what is wrong with the family, 61% listed permissiveness as that. That word permissive means not forbidding, not saying no. Here's a young child that, that wants to eat candy all the time, and we never say no. <laughs> well, when he or she grows up, unless they brush their teeth very often, they're going to have rotten teeth, you know? from eating so much candy. It's a proven fact. You can't eat candy all the time and survive and function as you ought. And so children sometimes have to be disciplined. And discipline not only goes as far as the family, it also goes as far as the church is concerned. Just as we are a family, there has to be times when we must discipline even in the church. Now what do you mean by that? If a member does something that is contrary to the will of God, then we as members... The church have a responsibility to that individual. Now, why are we doing that? Because we're playing watchdog? No. We are doing it because why? We love them. And believe you me, one of the hardest things you'll ever do is to go to someone, talk to them about something wrong in their life, because I can tell you what they're going to tell you. They've told me too many times. Well, you come up your own backyard before you come talking to me about doing something. And that's why we don't want to do it. And that's why we don't do it. We don't discipline as we ought because of that very fact. Well, it's not the fact that we're perfect. We don't claim to be perfect. Anyone in this building is not perfect. The elders are not perfect. I'm the preacher. I'm sure not perfect. And there's nobody here that is perfect. But I do know this, that if I do what God tells me to do and I'm obedient to His will, that He declares me perfect. Just as if I'd never sinned, that I can count on because the Bible tells me so. Am I perfect? No. I'm a human being, therefore I have faults. You have yours, but I can make my faults right any time that I choose. I can obey the gospel if I'm not a member of the Lord's church any time that I choose. But here's a member that's gone astray. Love says you discipline them because when you discipline them, you're saying, we love you. We want you to go to heaven, and we want you to do what's right. That's discipline, and that's love. And that's why we discipline our children, because we want them to grow up to be outstanding citizens in the kingdom, in the world in which we live. And when the church disciplines and does it properly, then it is because of love there. Third of all, love denies. Love denies. We can't always have what we want when we want it. Love doesn't allow that. As I said a while ago, when the child wants to eat candy all the time, then a good parent's going to say, now wait a minute, hon, you wait before you eat that candy and you eat your supper first. But if you allow that child to eat that candy before they eat the supper, then you know they're not going to eat supper because they already got their belly full of candy. But that's the way it is. We have to deny our children things. That's what love does. If an adolescent often wants nothing but entertainment. Now, we live in a world today where technology abounds, is it not? And if we as parents don't regulate our children, our children will sit before a TV with Nintendo or PlayStation or Xbox or whatever it is we have, whatever technology is in the home, and they'll play it from sun up to sun down unless you say, son, daughter, you have X amount of minutes on that thing and you get off of it. You have to deny them or they'll stay there all day long. They'll go blind playing those things. Is that not true? But love says, as a parent, you have X amount of minutes or X amount of hours, then I want you off that thing. 
That's the way love is. Many an adult wants to do anything and everything they want to, when they want to, how they want to, no matter what. Nobody has the right to say, I can or I can't. Well, we live in a country where you do have freedom. Don't get me wrong. We do have freedom. But if I'm a Christian, I, my freedom is only in Christ. My freedom is only what Christ allows me to do. Otherwise, I transgress God's law. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, in transgressing God's law, I've sinned. And so sometimes even adults have to be denied. That's what love is. God says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, in honor preferring one another. Love considers what is good for another. What one wants and what he needs are often quite different. You know, one of the things we have to understand is God never said he would provide our wants, did he? In the Bible, the Bible says that God will provide our needs, not our wants. A lot of us like to have a lot of things. But God's not going to provide it for us because he's not in that business. He'll take care of your needs, the things you really need in life. God will take care of, but he will not take care of all your wants that you might have. A sentimental feeling which provides all wants and no needs is not love. A lot of times, and this is what happens many times, and I hate to say it, but it's, it's true, it's in the church today, is that you have, we have so many families today who are divorced. We have single family, heads of household. As a matter of fact, in America, the single head of household families are growing at an outstanding an astounding rate. But here is a father, per se. He has the children on a certain time. And here he is, and while he has that child, he wants that child to have everything he wants. That's not good for the child, for him to have everything on and a lot of times, he, he is, what he's doing, he is substituting his love for things. And it goes just the other way. Here's the child. He goes back to mama. And mama has the children. She has them most of the time. So therefore, she has to adjust now because the child has been with his father this long. And father has given him everything and everything he wants. He comes home and he thinks, well, I'll see if I can get anybody with mama. I want everything I want. And it doesn't work that way. Or vice versa, it may even be reversed of what I just said. You see, the child has to be denied because you love them. What they want is not necessarily good. How in the world would a five-year-old know what's best for him or her? A lot of times, teenagers don't even know what's best for them. They come to mom and daddy. Mom, can, I, can, can, we, can, we, can I go do this? Can I go do that? And mom and dads consider what's being asked, what's being said. And they weigh it, and they think about it, and say, what are the pros, what are the cons, is this good, is this bad? And hopefully base their decision upon whether it's right, good, or bad. And sometimes it's bad because the child didn't make a good decision. His choice is wrong, and so we say, no, you can't do that because this is why you can't do it. It's not good. You're only looking at the short term. We're looking at the long term. We're looking at the end of the tunnel. You're looking at the beginning of the tunnel. And so we deny that child to do that. Fourth of all, love sometimes rebukes. Love exhorts, but sometimes it rebukes. One of the things that Brother Jim Dearman, when I was at Memphis School of Preaching, used to always tell us preacher boys, he'd say, now fellas, he'd say, if you don't lift them up as much as you take them down, you're not going to accomplish what you need to accomplish in the congregation. He said, you got to lift the brethren up. At the same time, I understand you have to tear down too sometimes. Because people don't always do what's right, do they? And wouldn't it be wonderful like I stand up here every Sunday and never, never mention a sin, never mention anything wrong with, with anybody, anyone of the congregation or anything the Bible might teach in a negative way. All I did was preach positive. Well, you might enjoy it, but you might also end up in hell as a result of it. You know, we have to be reminded 
Peter, in writing his book, the letters that he wrote, he says, I bring to your remembrance. Time and time again, you see that phrase in the Bible, bring to our remembrance. Why is it we have to bring to our remembrance? Because people forget. People forget. Do they forget on purpose? Well, sometimes they forget on purpose. We try to exhort as much as we possibly can. True love compels one to try to help those he loves. As a gospel preacher, the reason I'm standing up here is not because of the fact that that uh, I want to be mean or vindictive. Not that if I speak a, preach a negative sermon that I'm trying to be harsh. I'm trying to correct. I'm exhorting. Because sometimes we need to be told that there's some changes in our lives we need to make. And it's for the better. Sometimes our thinking is tunnel vision. We don't see outside the box sometimes. We don't see sometimes what we need to see. You remember when you think when you talk about this, you remember Eli, what kind of father he was? The Bible says that he he was a bad father. He was not a good father. Matter of fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 13, it says, His sons were vile, and he restrained them not. You see, he did not rebuke his son. Two of his sons, Joel and Abiah, were priests. And when the people, the women would come to make their sacrifice then they would do illicit stuff with them. And Eli never said a word to him, although he knew it was going on. You see, Eli didn't fulfill his responsibility as a parent. He should have rebuked his sons, and he should have rebuked them before all in that case. If we love our brethren, when the time of reproof, there is going to be a time of reproof and rebuke. Sometimes we have to be told that what we're doing or what we're saying or what we're thinking is wrong there. You remember the Apostle Paul told Peter in Galatians chapter 2, you're wrong, Peter. You're wrong to separate yourself from the Jews over here and go sit by the, or separate yourself from the Gentiles and then go over here and sit with the Jews. You made these Gentiles feel like they were not a part of the church and Paul rebuked him to his face. You remember Paul and Barnabas had some words as well. Why do some assume in the Lord's church that because brethren may not necessarily agree on things, that we may not agree on certain things, that we hate one another? Why is it? Why is it not that we can't agree and yet love one another? We don't have to always agree on everything. When it comes to the Lord's church and when it comes to matters of opinion, brethren, I do not have to agree with you on opinion. And when we talk about doctrine, that's a whole different ballgame. We've got to be on the same page there. You see, elders make decisions in matters of opinion. That's why we have elders. That's where they rule, in matters of opinion. They don't rule in matters of doctrine. Doctrine's already set. All they do is enforce doctrine. What God has already said, this, if he says this is the way it should be, this is right, this is wrong, that's what elders do. They enforce that doctrine. But when it comes to opinion, they rule there because somebody has to make the decision. And I don't have to agree with that decision as per se. If we want to have green carpet in here rather than the tan carpet we got here, and the elders decide, no, we're going to have purple. Well, if they want to have purple, that's their choice. They made the decision. You know, I'll live with it. I don't have to agree with it. But I live with it. Why? Because that's their responsibility. That's their job to do that. And so we have to understand the difference between doctrine and opinion. And when it comes to love, sometimes we have to exhort. Sometimes we have to rebuke. When it comes to love, also, fifthly, love hates. Oh, wait a minute. That, that doesn't sound right, preacher. You mean to tell me love hates? Yes, love hates. Read it with me, if you will, in your Bible. Amos chapter 5 and verse 5. Hate the evil, love the good. You see, if I love, I must love the way God loves. And God hates evil, but He loves the good. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Uh, Psalms 119, 104. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Proverbs 13, 5. A righteous man hath lying, uh, hateth lying, excuse me. 
And so we as Christians, love does hate sometimes. Love can hate. God who is love hates also. What do you mean God hates? Well, read with me. Proverbs 6, 16. Six things doth God hate. Yea, seven are abomination unto him. There are some things God hates. Those things that God hate, we as Christians must hate. Amos chapter 5, 21. I hate, I despise your feast days. That's God speaking there to the Israelites, the ten, tri uh, the ten northern tribes. Psalm 5, 5. Then hatest all the workers of iniquity. To regard man above truth and righteousness is not to love. Sometimes I have to hate unrighteousness, iniquity. I have to hate sin. Why? Because God hates it. Now, wait a minute. Don't get me wrong. I didn't say I hated the individual. I said I hate the sin. And that's what God does. God loves the individual. He just hates the sin that they're a part of. And therefore, although He loves them, and although they're in that particular sin, then God is not going to show the love that He would for those who do His will. Lastly, most importantly, love obeys. Love obeys. Love makes obedience a pleasure. We live in a world today, in a working world. You got all kind of people that want a, want a job. They'll come begging you for a job, but they don't want to work. If somebody came to you and asked if you had a job for them and, and say you had a job for them and they, you ask them why, why do you want to work for me well because I need a job and then here's another fellow says that you know I would just love to work for you I think I would have a good time we'd, we'd get along real good together which one of the two would you hire well you know which one you'd hire you hire the one that loved you and that wanted to be a part of the company to begin with you don't hire just someone because they want a, they want a job but love obeys there. He takes pleasure. You see, when we attend church because we love the Lord, not because we feel like we have to be here or else the elders or else somebody's going to call me or see where I was at or something like that. And sometimes that's the way we look at it. If we miss a service, someone calls us from the church and wants to know, you know, are we sick or whatever, we don't see that as love. We see that as, you're sticking your nose in my business. It don't belong. We say, that's not love. That individual is not worshiping God because he loves him. He's not going to church because he loves God. He's going to church simply out of duty. And there's a big difference. When I love the Lord and I love His appearing and I love to be a part of the worship services, that's what love is, obeying God. Obedience is essential. What did Matthew chapter 7, 21 say? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. There's the key. John 14 and verse 15. If you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. A sentimental feeling is not love. And it will not save you when it comes to religion. An obedient love, though, one who obeys out of a desire to please God, a desire to be a part of the family of God, is the kind of love, obedient love, that God is looking for. Six things that are negative as far as love is concerned that we need to come to grips with. Hopefully this will help us to better understand what the word love is. It's not a sentimental feeling. And it's not lust. It's a sincere desire to take care of one another, to take care of the church, and to love it as we should. If you're here this morning not a member of the Lord's church, become one. The greatest thing one can do besides choosing a major life is the obedience to the gospel. Hear the word. Act upon what you hear by believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God.
repent of your sins, confess the good name of Christ publicly, and be baptized for the remission of your sins, and in so doing, the Lord will add you to His church, the family of God. If you are a member of the Lord's church and you've gone astray and you need to come back, we encourage you to do that as well as together we stand in Ezra's name.